Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 97 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. We're almost at 100 episodes, which just blows my mind. And today we are joined by Sandra Tenge, who's a naturopath, a nutritionist, a herbalist. She's got so many skills, so many feathers in her cap. And she's joining us today to talk about food sensitivities, food intolerances, food reactions, and that all-important aspect of how do we bring food back in? And then how do we know what's actually causing us problems or not? Uh, and her process for, um, for working with her patients around that. Now, Sandra works with a lot of people who are dealing with SIBO and they're also dealing with a lot of food issues. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, Sandra. It's really great to have you here. And for those of you who are watching or listening Uh, to this, there's also a YouTube version where you can actually see our wonderful faces. So head to the Healthy Gut YouTube channel. Just type in the Healthy Gut when you get to YouTube and you can see the video version. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or any app that uh, you play your podcasts through, then obviously you're just getting the recording. Now, don't forget, guys, that you do get the full transcription from today's episode when you join up as a member of the Healthy Gut. So you do that for free, which is great. Uh, So just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast and sign up as a member today so you can get all of the transcriptions from season three. Now, Sandra, let's start off with a little bit about you, why you got into naturopathy and nutrition and, and why you became a herbalist and why you've really honed your skills around supporting those of us who have a lot of issues when it comes to food. Sure. Well, I, was, um, I started my career as a nurse and I worked in intensive care and it was there that I really decided I wanted to shift from kind of, uh, you know, that acute end stage kind of treatment of chronic illness and work in more the preventative kind of space. So I um, studied as a nutritionist and naturopath and herbalist and um, just loved it. I just kept studying. I did um, some traditional Chinese medicine and all sorts of things and continued to just study until today, really, just so passionate about it. Um, About 20 years ago, probably when I first had my own clinic, it was associated with a health food cafe and um, lots of other things, you know, went along with that yoga. And we had lots of people come into the practice for all different reasons, not just to see me as a naturopath, but using all the modalities. And it was then that I really understood from the, uh, the people that came into the cafe how much of a challenge they had with what to choose each day and we had lots of gluten-free and dairy-free options and it really um, brought home to me that just everyone in the community how how big it was that uh, food intolerances were out there and people were really struggling with what to eat so um, that was really what kind of got me passionate about gut health and then I uh, had a family of my own and my children had um, parasite uh, issues so I kind of worked with their cravings and with their gut health in that relation Um, and then I had um, a short stint with a post-infective SIBO episode myself so then um, I really truly understood what you know IBS kind of felt like finally after all those years of treating people with it it wasn't till I would look down one day and and think I looked three months pregnant when I wasn't, you know, and and all of those feelings and um and symptoms that people had that they'd been telling me about, but I'd experienced it myself. It really then you know changed my perception around it. It's amazing how once we experience it ourselves, it just becomes so much more real because we've lived it firsthand and we know how uncomfortable it can be. Uh, And one of those classic symptoms um, for somebody with SIBO uh, is around food intolerances. And that was one of the things that I really started to experience first off. That was an ever-increasing list of food I could no longer tolerate. 
And it had started with gluten and dairy uh, when I came off those two substances when my endometriosis specialist recommended I pull them out of my diet because it really helped from an endo perspective. And it wasn't until they were out that I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realise how sick I felt when I was eating those foods. And a classic for me was the 3 p.m. slump. And I used to literally need to lift my eyelids with toothpicks just to get through the afternoon. And so then I would eat heaps of sugary things, have strong coffee, um, just to try and get through to the end of the working day. And once the gluten and the dairy was out, I just had unlimited energy. I couldn't believe I didn't have the afternoon slump anymore. And that was the very first time I connected food and how I felt. Um, But let's talk about some of those classic food intolerances that you see with people with compromised digestive health. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the, I mean, there's lots of physical symptoms and energy and mood symptoms too, isn't there? There's, you know, it goes across the board and um, sometimes it happens insidiously, like it might have been doing um, with you perhaps, Rebecca, that you didn't really realise you were symptomatic entirely until you'd cut them out and then you said, wow, I now feel so much better. So um, sometimes the the change and the deterioration is insidious and just happens over a slow period of time, especially when there's inflammation involved, um, in which case you might not even say, you know, look, I'm, I'm reacting like that. It might be might be a much slower process, which I think it was for you by the sounds of it. And then when they're out, you, you know, you bounce right back up again. Definitely. And it, it was one of those things where I would, I started off with gluten and dairy, and then I went travelling and got really bad food poisoning. Uh, I went vegetarian and I then started to really react to lentils and grains, which was a bulk of my food. Uh, then went by the time I moved back to live in Australia, it was things like onion and garlic and, and chilli, those kind of higher FODMAPs. Um, I could have really strong reactions to pears and apples or I'd get quite bloated and gassy after eating them. But I still hadn't really connected the dots. I knew food was bothering me. I knew I couldn't eat more and more foods than I used to be able to eat. And I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't get answers as to what it was. Uh, Every time I went to the doctor, they did a blood test and the blood test showed I was fine. So (laughs) I was having the wrong tests, which were telling me the wrong information. Yes, and I I see a lot of patients in that um in that boat as well like often they've had some blood tests done and um, they might have even gone and had you know um, an ultrasound or x-ray or even you know gastroscopy and colonoscopy a lot of the time so that picture of um, you know IBS or SIBO it's often only picked up with the functional medicine testing rather than um, you know with with the blood test so I think that um, a lot of people have a long period before they they get diagnosed, which is, you know, very frustrating um, for them. But I think um, as time goes on, I think, you know, the FODMAP diet's been a great introduction because a lot of people now are starting with that, aren't they? And they're starting to, you know, be told, well, look, just try the FODMAP diet and see if it gets you anywhere. And it's something that you can do for a couple of weeks. Um, But there's so many more um, reactions you know, I think it's it's just really, I, I don't like people staying on the FODMAP diet even. I just like, you know, to use it if um, if people start from that point. Often they, they don't. If they come to me, I usually use my testing, you know, to begin with. But if people are starting at the FODMAP um, point, just for a couple of weeks or a month, you know, don't stay on it. It's just really an investigative kind of diet just to say, do I feel better? And, you know, can we challenge a few things in and out and discover um that it's telling us that there's something going on with these fermentable type of starches. We will cover that kind of food reintroduction diet later on in in today's podcast. Uh, But let's start off with the classification and the difference between a food allergy, a food intolerance and a food sensitivity. Um, Are they different? And if so, what are the differences? Uh Sure, absolutely. Yeah, they, I think um, when we the, the terms kind of get mixed up and, and often there's just an umbrella term of I'm having a food allergy, but that's um, really there's a lot of different reactions and they're quite different to each other and they're tested in a different way. So a true allergy is a IgE uh, immune-mediated reaction. 
Um, that gets tested with a blood test usually or scratch testing on the skin. And an allergy reaction is, uh, or a true allergy reaction that is an IgE, if we're using that term correctly, would only be those food symptoms that happened immediately and were immune system driven. So they often have a histamine type um, reaction picture. So if you kind of think swelling of the mouth, um, you know, sometimes as severe as anaphylaxis and difficulty breathing, um, but even, uh, you know, swelling, itching, hay fever kind of type symptoms. So if they happen immediately after the food and they involve those kind of symptoms, they can be gut related as well. You can get, you know, vomiting with an allergic reaction, but more predominantly you'll get um, the histamine type you know, reaction. Um, so that in itself is is very different to a food intolerance. A food intolerance is a um, also can be a immune system reaction, but it's a delayed immune system reaction, and it actually gets tested with a different um, a test, an IgG or IgG and IgA combined test. So those type of symptoms are really, um, I think, that more the majority of what some of your um, viewers and listeners experience. So those are things like our gluten and our dairy proteins. Um, eggs are a common food intolerance. Uh, even when people are sensitive to yeast, um, it can show up on those kind of testing. So really when we're looking away from the histamine kind of reactions and we're looking much more about your IBS type symptoms. So people are getting bloated or they're getting diarrhea or constipation or alternating bowel habits. Um, they might still be getting systemic things that happen. So they might still be getting very tired after a meal. Um, uh, you know, typically they have a reasonable size meal, not a big Christmas dinner, but a reasonable size meal. And then suddenly they just feel exhausted. Um, headaches, um, other inflammatory symptoms can occur. They might be developing eczema that they haven't had before. So uh, that's the category of, of food uh, intolerances that can be measured with that IgG test. Um, then there's other uh, malabsorptive kind of food reactions. So they're your typical lactose or fructose um, malabsorption. So you would measure those with a breath test. Um, they're part of that FODMAP group. So if someone comes to see me and they have been on the FODMAP diet and they say, look, there's something to it, I'm feeling much better, but I don't know um, which food it was, uh, you can always do a challenge following a FODMAP diet where you bring one of the FODMAP groups in at a time and then discover which food group it is. Is it the lactose, fructose, sorbitol, for example? Um, but also you can do breath tests for that same group of people to look whether they've got the SIBO or not. And I'm sure, you know, again, your community are, are well aware of those breath tests. They've probably had, you know, had them or, or had them discussed. So they're picking up not necessarily a malabsorption to the fructose or lactose, but the bacterial overgrowth that gives similar, you know, types of symptoms. And then there, so aside from, you know, those blood tests and the breath tests, there's also um, quite a few other food reactions that we don't have great testing for as yet. Um, hopefully we will one day. Hopefully there'll be one magic test we can do and, and discover it all. But because there's so many pathways and different parts of the body at play, um, I imagine that even when we can test some of these food chemicals, it will need to be, you know, yet another test that, that we come up with. But there are things like the um, food artificial food additives and preservatives and flavours and those kind of things that we have. Um, there is certain tests which, uh, you know, which may be able to kind of give some relevance to those things, but mostly with my patients that are sensitive or got any gut healing um, issues at all, I just say just take them all out. We don't really, we're not really trying to decide are you more reactive to blue than red food colouring or is it more... Um, you know, the preservatives rather than the flavour enhancers. It's just like, let's just strip back and get as many out as we can. Um, and then also the natural food chemicals. So the salicylates and amines and things like histamine reactions uh, are not easily tested for. And um, even though histamine is actually a bit of a tricky one because you can look like you're having an allergy with the histamine reaction because they're very similar. Um, uh, you know, there can be the headaches, there can be itching, you know, people can have insomnia and, and gut symptoms as well. But because there's the itching there, the first thing we usually think is let's rule out allergy 
do the IgE test and then if it's not allergy but it's histamine-like symptoms, then we can start, you know, investigating, you know, histamine intolerance in that way. So often for the food chemicals, we really have to do an elimination diet. And um, elimination diet is still considered the gold standard for, um, you know, for any food reaction. So uh, there's there's a few ways that you can do that. You can take out um, like just the food you suspect. So someone might come and see me and they might say to me, you know, I'm having lots of diarrhea. So I'd say, okay, you know, first on my list would be perhaps they might be lactose intolerant or they might be having some food intolerances. I'm not really thinking allergy for that person um, because it's not really, you know, that kind of classic picture. So I can do a breath test or I can just say, okay, let's do an elimination diet whereby we just have no dairy at all for a month or even a couple of weeks and we'll see if your symptoms go away and then we'll challenge it back in in a reasonable you know amount have a have a big exposure on one day and really kind of try and challenge you to say yes you know do I get my diarrhea back when I have that so that's just eliminating you know one food or one food group at a time but um, elimination diets can be much bigger than that so you can actually strip back um, you know all kind of reactive foods so all the foods that might be allergy sensitivity and intolerances really come back to a very kind of skeleton basic diet there's a um a protocol which is the royal prince alfred hospital elimination diet guidebook um, that i often use and guide people through and that's a really if people are super sensitive and they don't know where to start um and the testing, then they're not able to afford the testing or the testing's not available to them, then that kind of elimination diet and then guided challenge back in, you know, is the other option as well. And it will pick up anything because your body will tell you um, once it's once it's not had the food, it'll tell you when you have the food again that it's not happy in one way or another. It will definitely. And I'm actually thinking of my father who has uh, over the years developed an extreme reaction to onion and garlic uh, and he has to have a complete avoidance. And if he gets um, uh, onion and or garlic at a restaurant, for instance, he's, I mean, he no, he's violently sick. So his body tells him immediately, why did you give me the devil, <laughs> the devil onion and garlic? Hard um, to avoid yeah. too, isn't it? It's a really hard one to avoid because it's in so many things and it's used so frequently when you're eating in a commercial setting. Now in Melbourne, we're still in a lockdown, so that hasn't been so hard. No one's eating out at the moment. But when we're living a more normal life and trying to go out for dinner, um, it's tough. It's really tough. And the number of times, unfortunately, my father has been still exposed to it because they've used a pan or a grill So whilst if he gets a piece of steak, for instance, um, whilst they won't have put garlic or onion on the steak, if there's remnants on the pan or the grill, that's enough to set him off and put him into bed for days, which is really unpleasant for him. Um, Now, there are many people listening and watching who fall into the category of reacting to everything. You know, the number of people that contact me and say, Rebecca, I can't even drink a glass of water without bloating from it. What what do you do? I'm thinking of that Prince Alfred, uh, Alfred checklist there with, you know, that group of people immediately came to mind where they're just so reactionary to everything. Their body is in this kind of on fire state. How do you work with them? Yeah, there's. I suppose there's a couple of um, a couple of ways to look at it. In a way, you you almost need someone to be you know fairly robust to go onto an elimination diet like that. If they've already lost a lot of weight and they're not assimilating and um, you know they're really nutrient deficient, um, they're not able to do that level of elimination diet. Um, some people don't want to either. It's it's hard work, you know. So I think that um, for those type of people, really I I look at it as a bit of a priority. You know, I know that they're super sensitive to all sorts of of things. Often they're sensitive to fragrances and perfumes and, you know, they can't walk down the cleaning aisle in the supermarket without getting a headache. You know, they're sensitive to lots of environmental things as well, not just pollens and grasses but, but more smells and sound and light and, you know, it can be really, you know, overwhelming for them. So stripping that back, 
um, sometimes rather than trying to identify everything um, and say, okay, I need it all on paper and proven that you are reactive to all these things, um, particularly the saying that might that, that's not really getting them anywhere either. You know, it's identifying how bad things are for them, but it's not actually moving them in any healing direction. So certainly identifying what are the main key players that are making them most unwell, but also just starting them on that process of the healing part. So identifying is just one part of the, the protocol that I follow. Um, so identify and eliminate, you know, is up there, you know, ideally as the first part. But if that's not always possible, just coming straight into trying to heal that leaky gut or that intestinal permeability and allow them to start that process of being able to assimilate and be more um, tolerant to things as soon as we possibly can. So I really... Um, I move through a bit of a process with people, um, Rebecca. Usually I look at, um, you know, identifying and eliminating, you know, what we can within reason, depending entirely on, you know, a whole lot of factors about what they're able to do and if they're cooking for a family and how bad their symptoms are and, you know, how, like often, for example, with your with the SIBO group, I'll just say eat to your comfort level. So I won't necessarily have everyone on the super restrictive um you know or the, the the most restrictive part of the biphasic diet if they can eat you know to their comfort level semi-restricted i'll let them do that you know eat to eat as much as you can still basically but um but yeah then i start just looking immediately at their enzyme function so digestive enzymes um are amazing you know at, at helping us digest foods that we're unable to so a lot of the time why we're reacting to things in the first place is we don't have sufficient hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes. So making sure that they're getting replenished, you know, whether it's um, teaching the person to slow down and mindfully, you know, just relax and do some um, breathing exercises before they start eating, uh, really chewing their food thoroughly. So you're basically encouraging your own digestive enzyme process or supplying enzymes that can be um, taken as a capsule form or a powder form with the meal that they're having. So that might allow them to actually get away with um, for that, you know, time being until they're right, you know, further down the path and could do it themselves. It might allow them to eat some of those foods more safely. Um, you wouldn't do that with someone that was actually allergic. If someone's allergic, they have to stay off the food. But if we're talking intolerances and sensitivities, um, so healing the lining of the gut um, and rebuilding that that um, ability to assimilate and, and deal with foods. Um, also rebalancing the microbiome. So, for example, with the SIBO um, situation there in the small intestine, that's really why you're reactive. So the sooner we get that microbial or fungal overgrowth down, the easier it'll be. So rather than waiting, um, you know, sometimes... Uh, if we've done a little bit of work with gut healing um, and anti-inflammatory kind of support, then just getting into actually fixing the problem of rebuilding, you know, the microbiome balance. Um, and then also um, just re-inoculating the larger part of the bowel. Sometimes if we've got, um, you know, some issues with the large intestine and the microbiome there, you know, that needs to be addressed as well. Working with um, any stress that might be, you know, involved so there's lots of areas that we can work on at the same time and if we're already moving to having a healed gut, um, we don't need to worry so much about identifying everything. Um, it's just very sad when people get one list after the other after the other of what they can't have, you know, so the sooner we can move them through that process and, you know, we're aiming always to get you eating as much and, you know, a bigger diverse range of foods as we possibly can. Many of my listeners may well already be um, on a gluten and dairy free diet, but some of the compounds that are often spoken about amongst the SIBO communities are things like histamines, salicylates, oxalates, amines, those types of things. Let's delve into that a little bit more because I often get asked, I think I've got a histamine intolerance or a salicylate intolerance or sensitivity how do I test for it? 
Um, so talk us through what you do around those those kind of food chemicals or properties. That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. So talk us through what you do around those those kind of food chemicals or properties. Yeah, so they're, they're the trickier ones to test for. And um, uh, some recent um, reading I was, was doing is not only just the intestinal permeability kind of issues that happen, so the, um, the SIBO is affecting the gut lining and it's just affecting the way you absorb your foods, but also the back, some of the um, forms of bacteria that people have as their overgrowth of bacteria are also producing histamine. So it can be um, a combination, you know, of effects there. So if people, um, certainly if any, if people are on any medication that is also influencing that, it's good for them to be aware of what that is. So sometimes that's hindering them moving forward. Um, there's quite, quite a few medications that can do that. So I think, you know, speaking with their doctor about whether that's a possibility. Um, but not necessarily... Um, there's not necessarily a, a blood test where we can say, okay, let's measure your um, salicylate sensitivity, for example. So what we're going on is really a thorough history. So that can be in the form of, um, you know, just kind of giving myself or their practitioner as a sample diet for a week. And um, I sometimes I give my patients prior or usually I do this in the reintroduction phase um, a list of what the symptoms might look like that we'd be experiencing so then if they kind of highlighted or circled um, you know three or four different symptoms and brought that back to me and I could map it out against the um, when their reactions had occurred and what the food was it's really tricky for people to identify this at home on their own because sometimes the reactions happen very quickly after a food and then it's usually like, okay, you know, I get that. I had that and this is what happened to me. But often it's about a threshold that you've reached. So you might kind of start the week, you know, here and you've had, you know, one food and then you have the next and then you have the next and then you get your symptoms up here and you've kind of reached your threshold. Had you have only, um, you know, eaten two of those foods that week and then had a gap, you wouldn't have reached your threshold and you wouldn't have got your symptoms. So. It's a bit tricky for people, you know, to work out. I mean, people would will kind of, you know, tell me, oh, I had this food on Friday night and I've reacted, you know, I'm sure I've reacted to that food, but I had exactly the same meal last week and I didn't react, you know, what's with that? How's that happening? So um, that's often about you reaching, you know, a threshold. So once we've... Um, once we've identified, and it's usually just by talking through with your practitioner for those ones that don't have a test, um, what we think it is, it's, um, yeah, again, avoiding them for a shorter period of time or just um, moderating how much we have, rotating them every once every four days, those foods, so that we might be able to tolerate a little bit of it, but we wouldn't be able to tolerate it day in, day out. Um, and then, again, um, moving to heal the lining of the gut as soon as we can. Something like salicylates, we wouldn't ever remove all salicylates. The list is just enormous. Um, so it's just going down from the very high um, to the high or maybe to the moderate if we need to. Um, I use some software whereby I can put in people, if people have got a few intolerances, so say someone has got SIBO, they're also um, dairy protein intolerant and now they start started reacted to salicylates. It's so hard for them to pull out their handouts that they've been educated on, on, on each and then trying to decide what to eat, you know. Um, it's that terrible feeling of going into the kitchen, you're hungry, you're probably trying to do other things as well and you're like, I don't even know what to eat. I know I, none of this suits me, you know, or walking into a cafe and going, none of that suits me. Um, so the software that I use, you can put in multiple filters. So you can kind of say, can you blend a SIBO diet with a dairy free diet with a salicylate moderated diet for me and show me what I can eat? So I really like to present to people what they can eat rather than just 
list on top of list of what they can't eat. Yeah. That's it's so important and it's actually just making me think of uh, um, a comment I saw in a group just the other day with somebody saying that they have SIBO, they now suspect histamine and they said, well, I'm basically on the starvation diet. I'm just so scared to eat anything I'm not eating, which is the worst place to get to when you are just paralysed by fear of the fear of the symptoms cropping up, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what if I do it wrong. It's really tough. And so that's why it is, I believe, really important to invest our money wisely and to work with practitioners that have the experience and the knowledge and the expertise that they can bring to the table, like yourself, Sandra, so that you, you've you got support. You've got someone that says, well, actually, look at these 50 recipes that you can eat these are all within your parameters. So here's some yummy food to enjoy rather than here are all the things you can't eat and now try and figure it out on your own. It's a very overwhelming place terrible, to be. Terrible, terrible place. And on and, and on that point of getting that anxiety around food each day, that's, you know, it's a stressor, a big one, three times a day, every day of your life. It's, it's a lot. It's reoccurring, you know, frequently. And we know, you know, one of the techniques for, encouraging people's digestive enzyme function to return is to do this mindful eating which which means slowing down and bringing yourself into the parasympathetic nervous system so that's the rest and digest nervous system as opposed to the flight and fright so if you're anxious and nervous you're in the flight and fright response and all of your digestive enzymes and all your digestive function is just shut down because in a, in a true crisis you wouldn't need to be eating at that time but the body doesn't differentiate between a, a real crisis and just a, a stress over what you're going to choose so if it's a if it's an anxiety that's a perceived kind of threat you'll still react the same way and switch off all those important digestive enzymes that you need so we really need to foster um a, a relaxed way of choosing and being comfortable that what you're going to eat is going to um come into your body and be a safe food for you and be um, you know, a food that you can assimilate and is going to nourish your body, all of those things and, and feeling confident and comfortable that that's going to be the way, like, you know, most of the population do that, but they take it for granted, don't they? You know, they sit down and they enjoy their meal and they don't need to worry about um, the group of people that are dealing with food intolerances. It's a whole different uh, different ball game for them. One of the things I did when I first started out with my own treatment was um, very intuitively I realised I needed to start to reconnect with my body and my food and my mind because for years it had been a war against myself and my gut and food um, and I had been in very stressful jobs. I'd been you know, working really long hours and I never gave myself time to just eat and digest I was always on the go, I'd eat at my desk, I'd eat on the run, you know, I never just sat down. And probably a week into the original treatment, uh, I was making myself lunch, and I've talked about this on my podcast before, but it's, it is important to, to re- remind everybody of this, because this is a, a theme that is present in almost all of my one-on-one coaching calls with my SIBO clients. And that is around making time to be present to help our body digest food. And what I what I did was, you know, visualized myself eating it, thanked myself for making this delicious healthy food. Um, I visualized the food going to every single cell that needed it most, that it was going to nourish the cells. And I don't know where it came from, but I just felt that that's what I needed to do. And literally within two or three days, my symptoms had reduced enormously. And the difference was that I was actually just letting myself take take time to eat. So rather than eating in five minutes, I was eating in half an hour. That huge difference made a huge difference in my gut. And the other thing that I see regularly with my clients is – they're speed eaters. I was a speed eater. They could win awards for finishing their plate of food in record time. And what I do with so many people is that we work around the basics, you know, how to put the food in their mouth, how to chew it slowly, knife and fork or spoon going down between every single mouthful of food so that it's not poised and ready to keep going 
because when we actually pause and stop and chew, we realise that for years we haven't really chewed our food at all. No. If it's um, I do this with, with my children clients. I challenge them within the consult to chew something 100 times for me, you know, and you just sit there and you watch them and it's an enormous amount, you know. You don't need to chew everything 100 times, but ideally you should be chewing it until it's melting in your mouth and, and just going down. Um, and they're a funny group to watch because they're just, you know, their mind's going, what are you why would I do that, you know? But I remember there was a, a gentleman that I um, was going through exactly this process, you know, and I have a, a similar to what you were doing intuitively, which is amazing, you know, it's a, a like a bit of a ritual around food where there's a visualisation and there's a breathing exercise and there's a stretch that opens up um, the chest here at the front. So, you know, it can all be done within a few minutes. It doesn't need to be, you know, an hour of meditation before, but sitting up straight, three very slow belly breaths, a big stretch to open up and get the nervous system, you know, in a, in the correct place and a visualisation, whether that's visualising food coming in or the digestive enzymes or the it, it could be a golden light, it could be, you know, a beach, anything that switches that nervous system back into the, its parasympathetic state. And it doesn't actually take long to do it, it's just the frequency that you keep doing it so if you're really doing it regularly you know it it happens really quite quickly so I was explaining this to him and he said to me are you talking about eating like the French do and I said I didn't really know what he was getting at and he said you know like if you go out for lunch in France well when I traveled to France I was backpacking so I don't think I ever went out for lunch but he said in France everybody even at an executive uh you know corporate level gets given a reasonable lunch time and are encouraged to sit down, you know, usually with a group of people and there's, you know, there's different, you know, small courses of food, but there's laughter and there's talk and there's time to really sit and enjoy the process of sharing a meal together. It's not really, you know, kind of sitting on your own. I've got 10 minutes. I'm also kind of, you know, checking my phone and listening to this and really kind of going through a list in my mind of what I'm going to do next. Um it's really a different way of eating. And then, of course, you know, many of those European countries get a siesta as well afterwards, so they've even got time to digest. So um, so he said, he said, sure, you know, is that what you mean? Is that what I've got to do? And he was very matter-of-fact and he, you know, because he was so, you know, practical and, and um, on the ball, he's just like, yeah, I can do that if you want me to do it and I'll, and I'll do it. And sometimes people don't make many other changes with their digestion except slowing down and like you did you know see a benefit so an easy one that we can all do and we've all got all got to remind ourselves of doing it you know I've got to remind myself often of doing it as well the way I look at it is we can spend so much money on pills and potions in trying to uh, get rid of this overgrowth in our small intestine but if we don't do the basics, which is allow the brain and the gut to reconnect, to work together, to digest our food, we're just throwing money against the wall. And it was, it really was profound how much of a difference just changing how I ate and the period of time I ate, how it, just what a difference that brought to my life. It was, you know, it was quite staggering, in fact, because. I'd never stopped to think about it before. And now, you know, I'm five and a half years on from that very first diagnosis of SIBO. I can't eat the, at the speed I once could. And if I ever have to rush for whatever reason, I feel very uncomfortable from it now. Yes. You kind of feel now, it, don't you feel like that's not going down properly, you know, but it, it didn't used to. It just used to, you didn't even connect with the feelings of of your gut before you were you're unwell you know when you're unwell what you're doing is you're forced to really feel into how your gut feels all the time a lot of people don't really get a sensation from their gut at all yeah exactly so now it just feels stuck and heavy and I just go oh that was horrible let's talk through um the food reintroduction side because you've got a really quite specific formula and and I often say to my clients you know think of a glass and how full is the glass are you at the brim? Is the water falling out? Or are you, you know, quite empty and you've got plenty of room to pour more water in? And you've got a really similar philosophy, which you touched on a little bit before. But let's talk about somebody that, let's say somebody has got, um, has been challenging, um, has been finding histamines, high histamine foods a problem, and they're, they're feeling good and they're ready to 
start testing some of those higher histamine foods. How would we go about uh-huh. it? So there is um, there is the situation where you challenge something in a really big way to basically prove to yourself that that was your problem food. So that's a little bit different to reintroduction. That's elimination and challenge. So we really want to say, okay, we think that it was taking something out that helped, but we're not quite sure. Let's have a lot of that food on one day and see if it was. Um, and even the FODMAP diet works a little bit like that. You basically bring in, um, you know, you, you take everything out and then you bring it back in and then you bring it back in and you bring it back in the next day until you sh- you're kind of reaching your threshold quite quickly. You, so you're trying to reach your threshold in that instance as a way of um, diagnosing that that was your problem food. So that's different to reintroducing something that you just want to, be able to bring things back in. So when we're in that situation and our and our goal is not to identify but our goal is to reintroduce and widen what we're able to eat and get a bigger range of, you know, nutrients and, and all of those things, then we go much, much slower. So we, we only really want to start that process on a day when everything's at an even keel. So we don't really want you to, um, you know, be stressed that day. We don't want you to have had poor sleep. We don't want you to have any other um, immune system kind of inflammations or anything else going on because remember too that your um, the lining of your bowel has got the, um, you know, it's only kind of one cell thick and your immune system is right there and it's always um, sampling things all of the time. And it is what is most of the time causing you know many of these reactions so we really want it to be down regulated at the time that we want to do some reintroduction because we um, we're basically setting ourselves up to fail if we don't so make sure that we're at a baseline where if we're using your analogy which is a lovely one of the glass of water we're not just off the surface because we're likely to fail we've really you know we've got most of our symptoms under control for someone with SIBO, they might still be a little bit constipated or they might, for someone else, they might still have some eczema. You know, you might not have got rid of everything, but it's not fluctuating and swinging around like this. So even kill to start with. And then we uh, introduce the food, but, but also with the foods, sometimes there's a range of how reactive a food is. So um, with the histamine example, for instance, if something is very, very aged, it's much more likely to be a problem than if it's just a food that kind of liberates some histamine. So um, dairy, you know, is another big group that we I educate people on what the extreme is. It's not just everything is, is a problem. It's like this might be a 10 and this might be a 1. So with dairy, um, for example, if you have milk, cream, ice cream, they're going to bother you much more than an aged Parmesan cheese would, for example. So you, you really choose the ones that are, are the lower end and the least irritating of that group that you're dealing with. And then you just bring it in and you just wait four days. So you're not going to try and do anything else for four days. Most food intolerances, take they, they kind of uh, come in, cause a reaction and then slowly drop off again and that period the safest kind of period we work with is a is a four-day window so just like the threshold kind of came in the reaction dissipates or peters out after about four days so say if we've bought in something um on the monday we're not going to do anything until friday again and also um once we we know that something's okay, we just keep it in only every four days as well. And that ensures that, you know, we might be able to tolerate it that way. We've still got it in the diet. We've still got the experience and the benefit of it being there, but it might be once or twice a week that we have that food. And that allows us to then go, okay, let's see what else we can bring in. So then we might have, you know, 20 new foods in rather than five new foods in all the time. You know, the, the microbiome particularly loves diversity and all that we want all the different colors we want all the different types of food so rather than just go let's bring in you know chickpeas we might go well chickpeas are great but let's try and bring in the whole range of of legumes and we'll do chickpeas on one day but we might do you know uh, kidney beans or lentils on another day so then I 
uh, just have to watch, you know, we just have to watch and let the body tell us what's happening. We're not testing even the things we can test for. We don't test them immediately after a, a challenge or a reintroduction. We let the body tell us. So this is where I give my patients um, the list of all the things that might happen. Sometimes what happens is not what um, your symptoms were in the first place. So often, yes, you might get bloated, um, but maybe the next day you might get muscle pain. So you might think, if I didn't tell you that muscle pain was one of the things, you might just think, oh, I feel different, you know. They, you might not think, okay, that's kind of a bit fluey or a bit inflammatory. I think I'm, it's a reaction. So sometimes your reactions when we reintroduce are different to your original ones. Even um, there's a, you know, often we might get a discoloration around the face, you know, dark circles under the eyes, um, a ready sometimes. Now people, if they don't know that they're possibilities, they'll just kind of shrug it off. But if they're going, okay, any of these things might happen, I'm going to have my food, I'm going to like highlight or circle, you know, what does, then when that information comes back to me, it it tells me, again, what kind of reaction that they had, but it tells me, um, you know, that, they, that they're that they at their lower threshold. They might not have the bloating yet or they might not have one of their severe symptoms yet, but it's like, okay, you're reacting a little bit. And with that, we can both together decide, okay, um, how important is it for that to be back in? Um, sometimes something like Parmesan cheese, people are like, if I could have, if I could just have cheese, I'm happy to be dairy-free, but if I could just have some cheese... So, you know, we might they might be happy. They might say, you know, my bowels were a little bit loosey yesterday or I got a little bit gassy. If that's okay and that's tolerable for them and, when, and that's not doing any harm, it's just creating, you know, um, a bit of gas, they might be saying, yes, you know, happy to do that. And we say, okay, you know, you do that a couple of times a month, that won't be a problem. But we wouldn't then say, right, let's start drinking milk, you know, with our coffee again. Yeah. And how do you know what quantity or what volume of that food to actually try when you when you start trying to reintroduce uh-huh. it? So I go pretty small, again, because it's not a challenge. If it was an actual challenge, I'd go bigger quantities. But for this, I'd go, well, when I say small, I would, I'd, I suppose you're giving it a bit of a nudge by, you know, you're having a serve. So I would just say, okay, today have, you know, have some, You know, they might have been, for example, they might have only been having goat's cheese. They might have not been having any cow's milk products at all. So then I would say, okay, on this meal, can I have parmesan cheese instead and see how you go. Um, With things like um, the salicylates, I'd be going very small amounts. So I wouldn't say to someone, you know, eat a punnet of strawberries. You know, I mean, often kids, they can eat a punnet of strawberries. You know, you put it in front of them, tomato sauce, they can you know so you wouldn't want them to have a huge reaction because it'd be very uncomfortable for them you know they wouldn't be able to sleep that night they'd be jumping all over the house it'd be you know it depends on the symptom as well if the symptoms only likely to be a bit uncomfortable you can go a bit wider or a bit bigger um but if your symptoms pretty uncomfortable you know the people that are itching it's it's terrible for them to have an itching reaction um insomnia you don't you just don't want that migraine if it's going to trigger a migraine it's just like not going to be worth doing a big one it's just like you know just have the tiniest amount for sure and um just in terms of things uh, some of those symptoms that are a little bit more out of the ordinary what are some of the things that you see people experience um I had a I have a client a coaching client who has a finger so she calls it her ET finger and it tells her it's her beacon and if she gets a sort of um funny feeling in her finger she knows that's her body giving her a sign that no we're not quite happy with that thing that you've just tried yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's funny isn't it um people have become kind of clumsy you know, people become a bit off balance, you know, and that can be a hormonal thing. Often women become less balanced premenstrually. So something that's kind of, you know, delivering a hormonal message as well might do that. So that's not even gut related. It's not even, um, you know, related to, to skin or any of the normal the normal things. Um, one of my ladies today, she um, has histamine reactions 
and um, she's been she's had a real flare up lately because she's tried a few new medications and they've been histamine drivers and she's she's been quite you know doing quite poorly. So we brought her back. She had um, some DAO enzymes and that really settled her down, <clears throat> which was great. So she's just been reintroducing a little bit, you know, at the moment and letting me know how she's gone. And she had she didn't really have any, you know, overt histamine symptoms. You know, she didn't feel at the time much was happening, but she just got a lot of cramping. So um, twitching, tick. Um, where the nervous system is giving those little, you know, irritated kind of feelings. Um, sometimes that can be magnesium deficiency and other things as well. So you've obviously got to kind of think, okay, you know, what's the other parts of the body doing? But for her, that's her thing with histamine. She's she's not particularly typical. She just, you know, she's just getting cramps, and but they're, you know, obviously very irritating for her, and you don't want them going any further either. So. Um, you don't want her just getting more and more histamine reaction. So we stop there and we say, okay, you know, that's where you are for now. Um, for her situation, she had an enormous, you know, kind of um, worsening with stress as well. So any of the factors then that you can go, okay, you know, let's bring the other factors out, let's deal with your stress a bit more or let's change your medication and then we'll challenge again. And we might may, we might wait, you know, a month before we challenge again for her because you know she has to change a few other things to to allow her to be more um varied again and i think it's really important a really important takeaway message around allowing ourselves and our body the space to do this and uh you know so many of my clients are type a personalities they they're perfectionists they want to do it on their terms and it's often really challenging to then take a step back and go well my body's not actually ready for me to do it i'm ready psychologically and mentally but my body's not and you know the real take home message i hear from you sandra is allow the body time allow the body space to do it pick the right time to start trialing the new foods because then as you can, you know, success breeds success. And it's the, the first time can often be really scary and daunting when you bring a, when you try a new food. But when you've had success and it's gone well, that gives you the confidence to try it again and again and again and again. And when you do have a setback, it's not so bad because you go, oh, well, that happened. I'll just try a different thing next time and I'll just let my body calm down. Just to finish up, how do you handle, um, you know, those, if somebody's doing been doing quite well and then they have like what they would see as a huge setback, they might have a big flair to a food that they've tried, they're worried that their SIBO's come back, they're worried that they've regressed. Um, how do you work with your patients around uh -huh. that? Um, support's huge, you know, support not just through me but um, but through their family and, you know, other practitioners that they're seeing um really you know empathizing with the fact that you know they have had a setback it's you know it's not great and and people do have them and they have you know have them often um you know I work with a, a lot with prevention you know with people with SIBO for that very purpose because when I started working with SIBO many patients were getting their SIBO back again they would come to me because they'd had SIBO successfully treated it and it was back that was you know it's terrible it's like oh my goodness I put in all this money and effort and I thought I was over it um and I I mean I know you know yourself Rebecca that I think we've discovered that you know things like SIBO they will come back for you know subgroups of people not always the post-infective ones but sometimes those groups as well but if there's any underlying cause for their SIBO in the first place it's likely to come back um we really need to be on a preventative um mindset where we go okay you know I'm expecting this to come back at some time um I usually every so after you know someone's recovered or, or doing well I really try and educate them that you know at three months and then at six months and then at a year we really need to kind of check in and give some TLC um some more gut healing and some more work with the microbiome even if they're symptom free so I'm really trying to get people to that point of before you even feel it, you're, you may be beginning, beginning to be imbalanced again. Your immune system may be being um, inflamed. Your microbiome may be changing without you knowing it yet. So let's 
keep giving you the preventative kind of top-ups. But um, even with that in place, you know, and we can all benefit, you know, from that, um, but even with that in place, if there's a setback, you know, supporting that and saying, okay, you know, this has happened and, and that's, you know, we're going to deal with that, we're going to get back to where we were before. And usually I head straight back into um, the looking at the intestinal permeability and the inflammatory response. So unless it was triggered by something that they know, like, you know, they've had a stressful event or they've had, you know, an episode of gastro, you know, or the, there's something that's avert, if it's just coming back on its own, there's a reason why it's coming back. You know, the, the microbiome's changing or the intestinal permeability is changing or they've, they've reduced their digestive enzyme function that had been good before. Um, or the, the immune system is just becoming much more alarmist and much more reactive than it was and, and becoming more hypersensitive. So looking at their history of what, you know, worked for them before is really great. Um, having a bit of a toolkit at home um, so that they can, you know, even before they contact me or get in touch with me, go back to some of those, um, you know, supplements or some of those, uh, you know, kind of gut healing diet kind of plans that they can just return to straight away on their own um, and then if they don't bounce back quickly um, if they've kind of you know stripped back all of the things that they'd been able to eat and, and gone back to a pretty low inflammatory diet again or um, a bi biophasic diet if they had SIBO you know bring it back down diet wise put in some of the supplements um, that they have in their toolbox um, at home that are just there for those kind of purposes, you know, for when you do eat out and eat the wrong thing, you know, at the in-laws because you didn't want to say, oh, I'm not eating that, you know, and I can't have that, you know. So so there's always going to be times. So have a little tool, tool box at home of, you know, things that you do. And then um, if it doesn't resolve, you know, and, and it's bigger than that, um, go back and readdress what we think was the problem before. And then if it's not responding to that, retest again and, and perhaps it's something different, you know. Many people with SIBO have got a, another issue as well. Um, it's not always just one diagnosis, you know. Lots of people have got complex, multi, um, you know, multi-digestive kind of issues, but then also they might have other things as well. They do and I work with so many of them, as do you. <laughs> Um, now, Sandra, if anybody has listened to today's podcast and thought, oh, my gosh, I just need to have her look over my case, I need some support, she knows her stuff when it comes to food intolerances, allergies and sensitivities and food reintroduction, uh, how can somebody get in touch with you? Uh -huh. So I um, I work in, in private practice in Brighton in Victoria, Australia, but um, at the moment even we're all remote, so I also work remotely regardless of um, the current climate. So I can see people from all over the world and I have different um, time slots available, you know, for those international appointments as well. Um, so you can get in contact me, with me through my website, which is foodallergytesting.com.au and um, you can book an appointment that way. And, yeah, very happy if people have... Um, have heard things today and they'd like, you know, some more information or even um, just some of the resources or handouts and things like that. Um, if they already have their practitioner but they just think there'd be some value add with those kind of things, very happy for them to um, communicate with me that way as well. I work um, a lot with other integrative um, practitioners. So I think, um, Rebecca, in your other podcasts, I've, I've heard you saying the, the we all appreciate a, an approach where people have got a lot of supports um, available to them so um, certainly I'm the primary practitioner for you know many of my own patients but I'm also just a um, supportive practitioner for many as well who have another team. That's really great to know and yeah I, I really believe in building a dream team of practitioners because not everybody knows absolutely everything and it's really great to build upon the expertise of others to help um, really round out your treatment and that's what I've done with my own health uh, and it has really served me well and um, you know I get to I get to learn from the brains of all these other really smart people and uh, and start to you know learn about how I can improve 
the way I live my life and, and how I feel. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut podcast. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. And obviously, I will have all those um, contact points for you listed in the show notes. So guys, do head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast, where you'll see the full show notes from today's episode. And of course, don't forget to sign up as a member so you can get the full transcription. That's really helpful to uh, follow along and read and listen at the same time or even print out and make notes on. So I love doing that too. Uh, but Sandra, thank you for coming on to uh, episode 97 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Oh, thank you all for having me. So, guys, that was uh, the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you got a lot out of my interview with Sandra. Um, and I look forward to bringing you a future episode where we talk all about SIBO relapses. So make sure you tune in for that. But until next time, I'm Rebecca Coombs from The Healthy Gut and I look forward to coming to you on the airwaves or the video waves very soon. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.